I got a fun package in the mail this week. In that package was my silver play button acknowledging 100,000 subscribers. So a couple of weeks ago after I hit 100,000 subscribers, I asked you guys what questions you have for me about how YouTube works, how I make videos, just general questions about me, whatever, whatever you wanted to know, and you guys responded. I got so many good questions and I think all of them are worth answering, but there's just too much for one video. So the questions landed in sort of four different areas, questions about me that aren't really related to the channel, but I'm happy to answer, questions about how monetization works on YouTube, questions about the planning process for making content, and questions about the technology and equipment I use. So for today's video, I'll be focusing on two main topics, monetization and how it works in general, but also for me specifically, but first, I want to give you the history of my channel because that's going to give you some context for the choices that I have made about how my channel is monetized. I will share with you how much money I currently make on YouTube as well as share information about other sources of revenue associated with my knitting life. In a future video, I'll talk about my process for creating content, including the planning stages and the filming process and the equipment I use. And I'm thinking that I'll answer the more general questions about me personally here and there in future Casual Friday podcasts, maybe as an Ask Me Anything segment. So feel free to keep asking questions. As always, there are chapter links that you can use to jump to different sections of the video if you want to skip ahead, and you can find those at the bottom of the playback screen if you tap or mouse over it. YouTube started in 2006 as a video sharing platform. I created my channel in March of 2007, not because I wanted to create a knitting channel, but because I had videos of my figure skating daughter that I wanted to share with out of state family members. In my knitting life, I was just finishing up level one of the master hand knitting program. I have a degree in communications with the equivalent of a minor in mathematics. I had taught classes and workshops for desktop computing in my corporate life, and I was later an IT director. I taught fiction writing workshops at local and national conferences in my hobby life. But despite this background and the fact that I was working on the master hand knitting program, I had no thought of teaching knitting because at the time, my knitting style I thought was kind of weird. And while it worked fine with me, I didn't feel like it was something that I should inflict on other knitters who were learning to knit. So in 2007, when I joined YouTube, social media had barely existed. Like if you wanted to communicate with other people on the internet, you did it through online forums and email. You couldn't really share a video easily in forums or through email. And so YouTube became a way for me to do that. I could upload a video of my kid and send the link to it to our out of state family. I had no thought at all that anyone else would come across any video I had uploaded and watch it. Um, you know, like why would they? So I didn't think anybody would see one unless they had a direct link. Well, later that summer, I heard about a new website called Ravelry, which was an online knit and crochet community. And that site was in the beta testing phase. So there was a wait list to join it. And it took about two and a half months for me to get my invitation at the beginning of October. By that point, I was about halfway through the level two of the master hand knitting program. And my work on that just came to a screeching halt because I threw myself into the Ravelry forums, reading the technique questions people had and realizing that I kind of had a knack for answering knitting questions. The next year in 2008, I started teaching classes at my local yarn shop. I kind of got over the thing about my knitting style and I had developed additional styles. 
I had never taken a knitting class myself, so it was really interesting to watch other people learn to knit and to hear the reasons that they had signed up for classes and to see the challenges that new knitters faced. In 2009, I was asked to take over a column in New Ravelry's newsletter. It was called This Week in Ravelry. And the column was called The Tip Jar. And it was a compilation of all the best knitting tips found in and around the Ravelry forums and groups during the previous week. I was asked to do this because I answered a lot of questions in the technique forums and I was kind of visible in that way. But I wasn't really that interested in compiling other people's tips. <laughs> so I asked if I could instead write a column where I answered knitting questions in depth, basically technical knitting tutorials. And they said, sure. It was all volunteer based and I was volunteering so I could do whatever I wanted. It was that combination of teaching knitting classes locally and writing technical articles for Ravelry, which was online, that led me to creating knitting videos that could be used as reference material for my students at the yarn shop and for the Ravelers reading my knitting column. YouTube was an ideal place to store those videos. Now, YouTube, of course, it's free to use, but they had to make money. They had to pay for the cost of, of running the platform. As YouTube became popular, advertisers were more interested in advertising on the platform. There were some YouTubers who actually were generating regular content and had subscribers. They had people following them. YouTube created this program called the YouTube Partnership Program, and they invited those larger creators and their channels to, sh to join the partnership program and share in advertising revenue. Naturally, I was not included in that partnership program. What did happen though was that YouTube wanted to give small creators the opportunity to earn money from viral videos. So a small channel might just have a, vi a video that got millions of hits and they wanted uh, those creators to be able to share in the revenue. So toward the end of August in 2009, YouTube started the individual video partnership so that small channels could share in the revenue generated by their video that happened to go viral. So imagine my surprise when just about a week after that program started, which I didn't know anything about, I got an email from YouTube congratulating me on the success of a recent video I had uploaded and offering me the opportunity to monetize it. So the video, was one that I had created for my knitting column on Ravelry. And on the day that I received that invitation to monetize it, that video had gotten, are you ready for this? 879 views since it had been uploaded a couple of weeks earlier. <laughs> So the bar was pretty low for getting individual video monetization. Now, in order to receive the ad revenue from YouTube, you have to set up a Google AdSense account. And I don't know if it's any easier nowadays, but back then it was kind of a pain in the rear and they were asking a lot of questions like social security number and bank account numbers and my home address. And I just wasn't too sure about it. So I didn't complete the process in order to monetize this one little video. But over the course of the year, I kept getting emails about other videos that I was uploading. So in September of 2010, I finally got my AdSense account set up and I went into YouTube Studio, which is the workspace you get on YouTube to manage your channel. And I went through my list of videos that were um, eligible for monetization and I clicked on the button that allowed, allowed each of them to become monetized. Now I was monetized for a number of videos and I could start earning money. So let me show you how much money I earned in those first few months uh, in at the end of 2010. Google AdSense revenue, it turns out, is paid every month around the 21st. But they only pay you when you have at least $100 in your AdSense account. <laughs> and if you don't, then the money just sits there until gradually you have accumulated enough money for them to uh, transfer $100 or however much you have in your AdSense account over $100 
into your bank account. So once I understood all of that, I was pretty certain that I would never see any AdSense money, but that was okay because that wasn't why I was making videos. So I continued to write my Ravelry column until October of 2011, which was when the last issue of This Week in Ravelry was published. And I continued to teach at the yarn shop. In early 2012, I got an email from Google AdSense alerting me that I would be getting my AdSense revenue in a couple of days. So I was really excited I was finally gonna get paid and it had taken five years from the time that I started my channel until I reached that point. By that time in 2012, I was just finishing up level three, the final level of the Master Hand Knitting program. So for the next five years from 2012, until the beginning of 2017, I uploaded a new video about every year or two, not very often. I just didn't have that motivation of creating videos without the questions from uh, that I was answering in my column. And I wasn't really finding a need to create more videos for the classes I taught either. My existing videos, of which there were about 30 to 35, managed to, to generate $100 of AdSense revenue just about every other month, except in the summer, it would take three months. And during this time, monetization was opened up to all channels of all size. When you start a YouTube channel, you could become a YouTube partner. At the end of 2016, the shop where I had been teaching for eight years closed. The owner was retiring and couldn't find a qualified buyer, so she sold off her inventory and closed the shop. So if I wanted to continue teaching, I needed to find somewhere else to do it. I was feeling like I had been in kind of a teaching rut for a couple of years, but I hadn't done anything to get myself out of it. So I would either have to relocate my rut to a different yarn shop, or I was going to have to change the way that I was teaching. Now my husband suggested YouTube. He had often suggested YouTube to me over the years, um, but there were three obstacles I had to overcome. The first one was video ideas. In the past, I had trouble generating ideas for videos because I thought they should be something no one else had already done before. The second one was how to shoot demonstrations overhead. My method up to that point had been to set up a tripod, straddle it and reach around it and knit by looking through the viewfinder to make sure that I was in focus and in frame. It's a very unnatural knitting position and I didn't like it, but I couldn't figure out a way to position a camera overhead and and know whether that I was in focus and in frame. The third obstacle I needed to overcome was to really get a handle on video editing software. In those really early days, I had a Windows machine and I used a free program called Windows Movie Maker. I could make one edit and it would be okay, but if I made a second edit to a video, it would crash my entire system. So that was not a way to continue making videos. So eventually I got a new computer and it was a Macintosh and I bought a program called Final Cut Pro, which is pretty expensive and it's really robust, but it's not intuitive and it was a little overwhelming. So I was uploading so infrequently that the whole process was just so arduous and I, and I, I never, I felt like I was always reinventing the wheel every time and relearning how to do everything. And in the meantime, YouTube kept changing the way that you, uh, that you uploaded things. So I had to learn everything about running a YouTube channel every single time. When I was making that decision about whether or not to start teaching, really start teaching on YouTube, I needed to generate ideas for videos. And so I used this, uh, an app for mind mapping and it's a way to generate ideas and kind of write your ideas down in a way that kind of creates almost a tree or branches in all directions. And that worked really well for me because that's kind of how my brain works to begin with. When I learn information, I store it visually and I make these connections and understand the context of how everything um, 
is interrelated. So that mind mapping really worked for me. And I generated 150 video ideas in about a half an hour. So it was clear to me I had enough ideas um, to keep me going uh, for a year. So that obstacle was dealt with. The next one was the shooting overhead video. So it turns out that when a video sharing platform has been around for 11 years, some of the people doing videos on that platform are shooting overhead. They figured out how to do it and then they, they create tutorials to explain to other people how to do that. So I was able to use YouTube to learn how to uh, shoot my YouTube videos. So that obstacle was overcome. The third obstacle was the video editing software. I have a history of not handling frustration when I'm learning something because when I was young, I learned very, very quickly. And this was something that was frustrating me and I, and I didn't want to deal with it. And I decided that I would just have to learn to deal with that frustration of learning the complexities of video editing and that it would be good for my aging brain to continue learning things. So it was something that would be good for me. So those were the three obstacles that I, was, I had either overcome or was willing to overcome. So my channel was 10 years old by this time. And one of the things I absolutely paid no attention to in those first 10 years was how many subscribers I had or how many views I had in my channel. It just didn't matter because I wasn't trying to build a channel. I couldn't even understand why anybody would subscribe to my channel. I just, it was bewildering to me. But at the beginning of 2017, I had 7,000 subscribers before I started even doing a weekly technique video. And my channel was already monetized. So I didn't have any of those sorts of, of hurdles or of getting a channel established that some other people would have. I was also somewhat familiar to the online knitting community through Ravelry. So there was some recognition of who I was. It was February of 2017 that I started posting my weekly technique videos. And it took until September before I finally made $100 in a single month. From that point on, I got uh, paid every single month. So I wanna show you how monetization works on YouTube now, and then I'll show you the history of revenue on my channel as well. In order for a creator to earn revenue from their channel, they have to be part of the YouTube Partnership Program. Since 2018, the eligibility requirements for partnership has had two components. Having 1,000 subscribers acquired over any length of time that it would take to get that, and 4,000 watch hours within the past year. I was monetized years before this requirement was a thing. Now, currently there are four sources of revenue generated on YouTube itself. YouTube gives 55% of that revenue to creators. And those four sources are ad revenue, transaction revenue, channel memberships, and YouTube premium revenue. So let's go through each of those four sources. I'm just gonna use a friend sailing video as an example. So when I upload a video, uh, monetization is turned off for the video. I have to turn it on. So I do that right here. And as soon as I turn it on, then I have to say it, whether or not there's, there are any re kind of restrictions about my content, inappropriate language, adult content, violence, shocking content, harmful or dangerous acts, recreational drugs content, enabling dishonest behavior, hateful and derogatory content, firearms related content, sensitive events, or controversial issues. So I make knitting videos, so I can always safely say none of the above. And when I do that, then it says that I have done it safe for all ads, uh, that this is safe for all ads. And the thing is their system is gonna go through and check it. So if, 
if I lie about this and then their system re realizes that I lied, uh, then I could get a community strike. And then the more strikes you get, you get timeouts, you get, you might get your channel um, deleted, whatever. So I say that it's okay and then I'm going to submit this and then I can choose the type of ads that I am going to allow on my channel. So display ads only show up on a computer, like a desktop computer. So this little gray area here is showing where, what the video playback area is. And this is showing uh, where the ad will be. So when you are watching on a desktop computer, this is the area where you would see like recommended videos. And so the display ad is going to appear above that. So for most of these types of videos, I have a choice about whether or not I want to have them turned off or on, but nobody can turn off the display ads. You have to have display ads. So this type right here, it's showing the red bar right here, showing where the ad would be placed. This is something that was one of those little banners at the bottom of the page the bottom 20% of the, of the of video screen. I do not allow those because when I'm demonstrating a knitting technique, I don't want anything covering that up. And then sometimes I have a clarifying text that I put up at the bottom of the screen. So I don't want anything covering up anything that I'm trying to demonstrate. So I do not allow overlay ads. Sponsored cards are something I don't really know much about. I think this has to do with sponsored videos and I don't do that. I think that if the video is sponsored that when you get to the end of the video, there would be a card from the sponsor that maybe is a link. That is possibly what it is. I really don't know, um, but I don't use them. And then you have uh, the choice of uh, skippable video ads or non-skippable video ads. And right now this screen is actually telling me that I don't have a choice for that because my video isn't long enough. It's only a 45 second video of a friend's sailing. <laughs> um, but if the video was longer than eight minutes, um, then I can choose, uh, I'd have these choices. So I always select uh, before and after my video plays, I do allow both skippable ads and non-skippable ads, but I do not allow them during the video, which are called uh, mid-roll ads. So if I were to select mid-roll ads, the default is that YouTube's system would find a good place that um, to, to put an ad, but I would always have control over changing that location and even adding additional ads if I wanted. I do not use mid-roll ads. So non-skippable video ads are maybe six to 15 seconds long. They're very short and you cannot skip them. A skippable ad is skippable after the first five seconds and then you can skip the ad if you want. If you watch it for 30 seconds, then it counts as a view, as a playback view. And so the advertiser will have to pay for the ad, which means that YouTube and the creator will get the revenue from that ad. But if you skip the ad before 30 seconds has played, no revenue is generated. So that's how you can choose what sorts of, of monetization that you want to have. So there were four questions I got that asked about monetization and ads. Uh, the first one was, do you receive any benefit if I watch only a portion of an ad before clicking the skip ad button? If two ads precede the video, do you receive a bonus payment if both are viewed? And does watching the full ad help you make more money? So revenue is automatically generated from a non-skippable ad. Uh, revenue is generated on a skippable ad if you watch at least 30 seconds of it. And every video with a countable view will earn revenue. If you use an ad blocker, on your computer, then no revenue is going to be generated because no ad will be served to the viewer. So another question I got was, why do some videos play with no video interruptions like yours, thank you, while others seem to be interrupted every two to three minutes? Well, that is because of the mid-roll ad option. So if you are seeing multiple mid-roll ads, those were probably placed manually by the creator. My understanding is, and I could be wrong, is that if you let YouTube 
automatically generate a, a place to put an ad. It will only do it once. And mid-roll ads are only allowed in videos that are at least eight minutes long. Transaction revenue is revenue that is sent directly from a viewer to a creator within the context of a particular video. So for live streams, uh, this is done in the form of super chats and super stickers. And those are things that you can, you can click on a button during a live stream and you can send a super chat, which is a message that's highlighted that will go up the screen and they, they typically stay locked at the top of the screen for a while. And then a super sticker would just be like little cartoony type uh, pictures rather than, than words. And then you'll see the dollar amount that that person is sending to the live streamer. For pre-recorded videos, there is what is called super thanks. And those are sent through the comments. So right below the video playback screen where you'll see different icons, there's a little heart with a dollar sign in it. And next to that, it says thanks. So you could click on that and you could write a little message to the creator and send them money. And then your comment will appear in below the video highlighted with the fact that you had sent them money and whatever it was that you said to them. So that is what transaction revenue is. Channel memberships are a way to support a creator on a monthly basis through subscription. So there's a certain amount that the channel creator is sent each month. And these memberships are typically going to come with perks like exclusive videos that can't be seen by anyone except the members. Uh, I have not set up my channel for memberships. That fourth category, YouTube Premium, is a little different than the first three types of revenue sources. YouTube Premium is a monthly subscription. So here in the US, it's like $11.99 a month for a single person to, sub to get it. And you get at, they, what you get with that is ad-free uh, videos. You won't see any ads. Uh, you can get a household membership for $17.99 a month. And that allows you to add up to five more people. So you can have six people all together for that $17.99. Now, 55% of YouTube premium fees are put into a pool that is shared with all creators. So YouTube is still sharing 55% of this revenue. It's just set up a little bit differently because all of that, those fees, um, are put into a pool and then it is split up among creators based on whatever their percentage is of the total premium watch hours. For channels that have limited monetization, premium revenue can be really helpful because they at least get revenue from one source where they might not be able to generate ad revenue. So when you're looking at, a, at all of the different revenue sources for a channel, it's typically reported as RPM, which is revenue per mil. That's the French word for thousand. That refers to the amount of revenue a channel earns per 1,000 views. So it's calculated based on the total amount of revenue for all four of those sources, then divided by the total number of views on the channel. And then that result is multiplied by 1,000. So it's multiplied by 1,000 in order to give you an actual dollar amount result. Because otherwise, if you just reported it on revenue per view, it would be just a tiny fraction of a penny. So you can look at RPM for a specific time period, like a week or a month or a year, or you can look at it for a specific video, again, over a particular amount of time or just the lifetime of that video. So I typically look at what my RPM is on a monthly basis, and that's what a lot of YouTubers will describe. So this month, um, at the end of September, my channel has an RPM of $7, which means I get $7 for every 1,000 views or seven tenths of a cent 
for each view on my channel. When RPM is calculated, it takes into account all that revenue, the, the ads, the transactions, the memberships, and the premium. And it, so it is possible to separate out each type of revenue and, and look at, at at how much you're getting in, in each place and what percentage of your total revenue each of those are, if that's something that you wanna do. YouTube Analytics has a lot of different tools for analyzing um, data. So I mentioned that my RPM for September is $7. That is not going to be true for other YouTubers. It could be higher, it could be lower. For me, it varies from month to month and then from year to year. So what are the reasons that cause RPM to change or vary? Ads are placed instantaneously video by video through this auction. It's all done um, by computer digitally, instantaneously. When there's competition to place an ad in front of a particular video, that triggers a bidding process and that can cause the price of the ad to go up. So an advertiser isn't making an individual decision to place an ad in front of a specific video. Everything's happening automatically. That requirement to acknowledge that a video has objectionable content came from advertisers' realization that their products were being marketed at the start of videos that they did not want to be associated with. So videos that are considered not safe for advertisers will not have very much advertising. So channel category uh, is one thing that can affect the, uh, the cost of the, of the advertising to the advertisers. Uh, finance and real estate channels do really well, gaming channels, not so much. So another factor is the viewer location. So the cost of an ad to an advertiser is based on where the viewer lives. Viewers in the US are going to be served ads from US companies. Viewers in France are going to get ads from French companies. So some countries have more competition for ads than in other countries, so their ad rates will be higher. Another factor is seasonality. There's more competition for ad placement leading up to the holidays, and that makes the ad rates go up, especially in November and December. But then in January, the rates are the lowest because it's after the holidays and there just isn't the same competition for ad placement. A channel that has limited monetization on its videos is going to affect the amount of ad revenue that they can get. So if they have objectionable content, their ability to monetize their, uh, their videos for advertising is gonna be limited. So let's talk about how much money my channel makes. Most YouTubers have multiple sources, revenue uh, streams, that it isn't just their YouTube channel. And that is true for me too. My uh, secondary source of revenue is Kofi donations. So the idea is buy me a coffee on Kofi, and that can be a monthly uh, subscription. So uh, every month um, people might send me $3 or $6, and I have one who sends me $30 every month. Or you can just uh, do it a one time. Uh, or whenever you see a video of mine that really helped you, um, you could send me $3. That's, that's one way of doing it. So Kofi is a specific website. It's hooked up through PayPal. All of the money goes directly to me. I do have to pay PayPal fees, um, but they don't take any percentage of it the way that YouTube would with the uh, transaction revenue, the, the thanks, the super thanks. Kofi doesn't take any of that. Uh, so Kofi is a pretty significant amount of, of revenue that I get as well. Another source is affiliate income. I don't do a lot of that. The only one I'm signed up for is Amazon. So if I'm talking about some book in my library or, or something like that, I will see if it's on Amazon and I will put a link. And so anytime you click on one of those affiliate links and it brings you to Amazon, whether you buy that one thing or not, if you, you don't have to buy that. If you bought anything else within that session, I would get a small commission. Slightly less than half of my views come from the US and my Amazon affiliate link is only set up for the US. I just never got around to doing the international one. And I really, I really should, but I just haven't. Also, I write technical knitting articles for Interweave. I've been doing that for the past uh, five years. 
and uh, anywhere from one article to four articles a year. And they pay anywhere from $400 to $550, depending on the length of the article and which magazine it's going, going in and all, and all that kind of thing. I also do some teaching before the pandemic. I would occasionally do an in-person class on something. What I have done, though, is presentations to uh, different guilds around the country. I also have some patterns in my Ravelry shop. And I, I haven't released very many patterns in the past couple of years, but I've re released a few. And so that usually generates a, a couple thousand dollars um, a year as well. And then the, of course, the biggest thing is the video AdSense. So I do have some information about this year. September's not over. So most of, of my information is really for January through August. But I'm on track to make around the same amount of money, I think, this year as I made last year. It's hard to understand how the pandemic affected a YouTube growth and ad revenue. People were watching a lot of video. They were stuck at home. They're watching a lot of video. But because nobody was going anywhere, there was no advertising. And what advertising there was was spread out amongst so many more uh, video views. So April of 2020 was terrible. This year, um, things are pretty close to what they were last year. And I think in part because people are out, they left, they went out uh, and traveling around and doing the things that they couldn't do for the past couple of years. So this year is looking to be very, very similar to last year in terms of revenue. So of course, you don't just make revenue, you also have expenses <laughs> that are associated with the channel. So there's, you know, cameras, lighting, sound, computers, everything uh, gets updated over time. And pretty much anything that comes into this room, whether it's yarn, tools, books, equipment, whatever, is really a business expense for me because almost everything I bring into this room gets featured in a video in one way or another. I also have, you know, a PO box. I have subscriptions to various guilds. I have PayPal transaction fees. I have you know, all kinds of different uh, fees and expenses and dues and all kinds of things that add up. And they add, last year they added up to almost, or a little over $9,000. So the, the net income uh, last year was $24,237.48. People notice that I don't have mid-roll ads and I'm not, always asking people to join my Patreon. I don't have a Patreon, I just have Kofi, and I don't have channel memberships either. And I'm not trying to sell, you know, yarn or partner with somebody else to, to sell stuff. I would say, and I think most of you would agree, that I'm not currently earning enough to say that I'm making a living at this. There are things I could do to increase the amount of revenue I generate. I could, allow any type of ad, including multiple mid-roll ads, but I really don't want to do that. I could do more to promote Kofi donations rather than just putting it on uh, the end screen at, at the end of a video and, and supplying a link in my descriptions, but I do tend to feel a little weird about mentioning it out loud too often. I could do more with my affiliate links just by getting set up for like international Amazon links rather than just US Amazon because more than half my views come from outside the US. Uh, and I could also just include an affiliate link in every single video description, whether or not I'm recommending or a, a book or providing a link like that. I could do that. I could also publish more tutorials and patterns. I had been doing some design publishing around the time I finished the master hand knitting program in 2012, but by 2017, when I started my weekly videos, publishing patterns was really less appealing to me because Ravelry was saturated by that time with patterns from independent designers. Uh, it was easy to be a designer, it's easy to sell something, it's easy to get lost in all of, all of the designs. So the time and effort didn't seem like it was worth it to me for something that might only sell a few copies. 
But now at this point, because of my YouTube following, I could earn a decent amount from creating more tutorials. My August sock knit along tutorial from 2019 still um, makes uh, quite a few sales and has shown me that, that I could make a lot more money if I did more tutorials. I am unlikely to ever sell products like yarn or notions because my interest is in sharing information, not selling stuff. So my path to 100,000 subscribers was a really long one. My reason for making those first videos back in 2009-ish uh, was not in order to generate revenue. It was to share information. The process of doing all the research to get answers to the questions that you guys asked me has shown me that there really are additional opportunities for me to generate more revenue without changing the video viewing experience for my subscribers. So I'm not opposed to making more money, but because it's not my primary motivator, I just haven't spent a lot of time figuring out how to make more money. So I hope you've learned something from this video about YouTube, about me, about how monetization works, uh, about how much, how much money I actually make doing this. And I want to thank you guys for asking the questions that caused me to really examine what it is that I'm doing and what I could potentially do differently that would benefit me without being detrimental to you guys, the subscribers. So if you have any more questions about YouTube and monetization or about me or, or anything at all, you can leave those down in the comments below. And thank you so much for, uh, for bringing me along to 100,000 subscribers. I have a lot to be thankful for. I'll see you next time.